Grace, peace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father and from our loving Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard this text being read to you and preached over? And how many times have you heard basically the same idea? And I could use this from different angles and I have in the past. One is to say that Jesus saw the crowd and he had compassion on them. This is especially brought out in the Gospel of Luke. Or we could say, look at the miracle here. A small boy's lunch feeding 5,000. We could go there. And we could go to the idea that these people wanted a king more than they did a savior. What did they need most? Somebody who would take care of this life or somebody who would take care of this life and the life everlasting. However, this morning I see this in a different light. I take my clue from places in the Bible where Jesus is especially concerned about timing. We go to the first miracle and Mary says, Son, help out here. And Jesus said, My hour has not yet come. We go to the last part of Jesus' ministry when the Pharisees even came to Jesus and said, Herod is looking for you to kill you. And Jesus answered just about the same thing. Namely, it wasn't the right time, neither was it the right place. His ministry was not yet complete. Let's look at some things. First, John the Baptist was well known and received by most of the people. It says in the Bible that all of Jerusalem and even the Pharisees came out to see him. He was believed to be a great prophet and he's the one who pointed to Jesus and said, there, there's the one who was to come, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just on his word alone, we could see that the people could have accepted Jesus Christ. And secondly, Jesus performed all these miracles and the people could say, yes, this is the one. Look at all the miracles. How else could it be? Often we read this text and we come to the conclusion that these people really wanted to have a bread king. Do away with work. Sit around and let this king, and the king represents what? The government, take care of you. Establish a welfare state. Just sit around and do nothing and the government will hand you everything. And you can even look at the idea that we're taking from somebody who had and giving it to those who have not. Washington would love this interpretation of the gospel. Well, I'm not going to go there. You see, I can remember a time, and I'm sure it was not new with my generation, when it was disgraceful, it was embarrassing to take a handout. You were supposed to have some self-respect, you were supposed to work for a living, and if you couldn't, your family or your church took over. As a matter of fact, in college when I studied uh, politics, our professor said, way back when, the Democrats and the Republicans and the government didn't take care of anybody. It was always the church that you went to for aid. And then again, the idea that who wants a handout? Who wants to say, I can't make it on my own? Now times have changed, that is true. And the government has fostered that idea. But I'm not going to go there either. Luther said, always put the best construction on everything. So I'm going to look at these people and put the best construction on them and say that, look, John had attested that this was the one who was to come. Jesus had attested his ministry with all the miracles. And so they said, it's him. Why wait any further? But the idea was, it wasn't the right time. The Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. For centuries, from the first of Genesis, the third chapter, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, the prophets had said, the Messiah, he's coming. And they described who and how and where. But he didn't come. Why? The time was not right. Historically, we can say the time was right when he was finally born. And why? Well, humanly speaking, we can say, first of all, the Greeks conquered the civilized world and enforced their language on everybody. 
So now when the gospel was going to be shared, everybody could hear it and understand it in their own language. Secondly, the Romans took over the Grecian Empire and put their laws and their trade routes into practice. And so now the apostles could go from Jerusalem to Rome and everywhere else. Without these two things, it would have been very difficult for the gospel to go like it was. So in the fullness of time, when these things were set in place, then the time was right. God sent forth his son. Now the Bible tells us that there's a time and season for everything. In our text, time wasn't right for Jesus to become the king. How important timing is. You know, in my first congregation, I had a 98-year-old man who was very alert mentally, but he was blind and he was incontinent. He was a widow. He had eight children. Seven of them were in church every Sunday and the other one hadn't been in church in decades. I would go to him every month and bring him the Lord's Supper and visit with him and so forth. And he would always say the same thing, Pastor, tell God I'm not supposed to be here this long. I'm supposed to go home to be with Jesus and with my wife and all the others. And I would say, Mr. Apple, God has a time for everything. He has a time for you too. Would you say, Thy will be done? Month after month, the same request, send me home, send me home. Well, the son who didn't go to church lived with his dad. He was in his 60s already. And he would not really socialize with me, but he would stay in the next room and he would listen to my conversation and to the devotions. And one day, about a year after I was there, he said, Pastor, when dad goes, I'm coming back to church. About two months later, Mr. Apple died. We celebrated his life there in the church. And sure enough, Mr. Apple Jr. started to come back to church. And all that time, when he saw the church cared for its own, and when he heard the word being shared, it was the right time for him to come back to the Lord. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time when you and I will leave this earth. God has that date and that moment and that second already picked out. It could be in death. It could be in Christ's second coming. We don't know. But we do know that God has a time and a place for everything. And in the meantime, He has something for you to do. I think of our pastor here, he told us that he was about ready to die when he was five years old, is that right? You had that automobile accident? Ten. Ten years old? Well, ten years old. <laughs> and he's still here. Why? Because God had a role for him to fill out. And how he has blessed our congregation before he was here. I'm sure he shared the word in the Navy and in the Boy Scout and other places. I was at death's door twice for malpractice operations. Many times in my youth and in the Army in Florida, almost, what did they say, bought the farm. I'm here, and for one reason I'm here to harass you a little bit, <laughs> to tease you, preach a lot of law, maybe a little bit of gospel. Now, this isn't limited to pastors or to great elders of the church. And by the way, that elder that I spoke about, Mr. Apple, he had three Bibles, Russian, German, and English, and they were all marked up and well-worn. Now, it also means you. You are in the middle of your community in the middle of your circle of friends, your family, your club members, whatever, and God has a mission for you. There's still somebody out there somewhere that needs to hear the gospel, that needs to be invited to come and hear the word with you. What are you doing about it? What? How many times or have you ever had a near-death experience? I've had several. 
Oh, I want you to raise your hand if you think you had a near-death experience. Go ahead and raise your hand. Now, I want everybody to raise their hand. Go ahead, everybody. <laughs> and you know why? Because you've all had near-death experiences. Sometimes you knew it and sometimes you didn't. What about that drunk that had to have one more for the road and he passed out and somebody had to drive him home? Do you know he was scheduled to run into you and God prevented it? What about that tire that almost blew out but it had enough air to get you into your driveway? If it had blown out when you were traveling 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, you would have had a fatal wreck. But God saw to it that you got home. And I could go on all morning long, but you get the picture. God has been watching over you because he cares about you, number one, and number two, because he has something else for you to do. Your ministry is not yet complete. And if God was using this 98-year-old blind, incontinent person to allow a ministry to happen to his son, let me go back even further to Palm <clears throat> Sunday. What did Jesus say? I need that donkey. And if God needed this 98-year-old blind man and he needed a donkey, do you fit in there somewhere in between? Maybe even a little more? What is your ministry that God has for you yet to do? The Bible says, behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And if you don't get around to it, when will you? May I suggest to you that there's no better time than the Lenten season? You know, when you say to a person, I'd like you to visit my church, what do they hear? You want me to join your church, don't you? Mm -hmm. But when you say we're having suppers, what do they hear? Supper. <laughs> Easter breakfast. <laughs> what better time do we have than during the Lenten services? And by the way, our our non-traditional services as far as Protestants are concerned, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. What about Easter sunrise? Timing. Don't wait until after Easter. Ask the Holy Spirit even right now, who is it that he wants you to share an invitation with? Let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works. That they'll want to give glory to God, your Heavenly Father, with you in your own place of worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.